the first thing to say is that is not my translation. That's Google's translation. So if you don't like it, it's not my problem. <laughs> I will take no responsibility for it. But um, we're going to talk about some of what I did last summer. Um, and maybe in another meeting, we'll touch on more of what I did next summer, last summer. But here we go. So what did I do? Um, I was asked to be involved with a dig up at Brandier's Farm, which is just outside Mindy. Um, it's a community dig being run by Cotswold Archaeology. Um, it was run last year, and I did three days last year, and I did my job a bit too well. And Peter in charge said, can you come back and do all three weeks this year? So although normally it wasn't all summer, by the end of it, it did feel a bit like all summer. Because <laughs> five days a week so is a pretty solid week when you're doing this game. Um, so up at Mindy, so nice and easy to get to, which is lovely. Yeah, I've circled where we are, so Mindy's top left, all ball and bottom right, so you just make two routes. You can either go up the 419 and then come off of Coles Hall Water Park, or you go out to Wooden Bassett and just head north, um, depending on the traffic. Google's very handy for that. When you try to direct you that way, away from the direction, believe it. I got caught up once or twice. So, why Mindy? Um, Mindy turns out to, well, it's on clay. That's the first thing. And you can tell very wet clay because it's near the. Water park obviously wasn't there when the Romans were, but very wet level. Lots of clay. So what do they do with clay? They make tile and brick. Lots of tile and brick. And the reason that this one's particularly interested is we're not far from Sirencester. So mind you, at the bottom, different scale map here. Sirencester at the top, only about seven miles away. So a Roman cart could travel that in about a day. Um, and they were making tile and brick. So it, we'll get on to why that's of particular interest. That's what we're here. Um, obviously, being clay, it rained a bit this summer, didn't it? There were a few days that it was entertainingly slippy between the fine scent and the trench. Um, when you're carrying a bag on your back and it's sort of, it's like sliding all over. Um, so, I was on the finest processing side last year. I weighed, I think it was 750 kilos in three days. This is about the only archaeological dig I will ever be on, where the finds turn up in these white bags, generally by the wheelbarrow load. That's not your normal finds processing tent. Um, and they, they turn up, the bags have got context numbers on, and then we sort them. Sorting them. In a wet summer, they're coming in like this. Covered in clay, because it's clay soil. Wet clay, sticky clay, lovely. Mm. So you can see there, we've got a bucket of water. That must have been the start of the day, because it's a clean bucket and clean water, and it doesn't stay like that. So, we're sorting through it, and we're sorting it into, and we have to put the speaker down, um, mic down. We have tegulae. This is just a small piece of a tegula. Um, Roman roof, flat roof tile, raised edge. And then you have imbrex tiles, which used to sit covering the join. Roughly speaking, that's Roman roof. There are complications to that. Um, but we're sorting it into, and we, we kept, after last year when we didn't do it, this year we kept all the buckets in the same order so that every day I knew that it went tegulae, imbrex, which are those ones, flutile, which are the ones, anything with combing on. So mostly these are the tiles that are set into the wall to form part of the central heating system. Then we had the brick bucket, which is anything flat and greater than 30 mil thick. So we've got things like this. This is just a part of a 
probably foot square tile pedalis Latin. Um, this is just a fragment of the thick one. You see how thick that is. Um, they get up to bipedalis. Well, the bipedalis has to be thick for this sort of, th um, you know, to retain its strength. But weighs is an absolute ton. So, so there we are. We're sorting that whole fifth bucket. Everything we can't identify. So the chips and bits and pieces that you really can't tell very much from. And you're sorting it, or you're cleaning it and you're sorting it. So we're looking for anything that's interesting on the tile, and we'll come on to some of the things that we found. Cleaning it well enough to be able to tell a piece of flue tile from a brick has it got the homing. And then the bracket on the end, all the rubbish we can't tell anything about. Um, so last year we were part of the process is at the end of sorting them. We weigh, we weigh it all, all and we count, count it all. This is not the most interesting part of the process. Um, so weighing is not too bad. You can put it all in the bucket. But last year we had it hanging off the roof of the tent, the scale off the roof of the tent. And uh, the buckets can get about 18 kilos if you load them well. And then you start thinking, oh, what's that roof of the tent? So it's just one of these ones with a fancy cross frame, you know, sort of scissor frames. Um, and then counting is a bit tedious, not too bad for, you know, the Imbrex and the Teguli. The brick, part of the process they needed us to do was to quantify it by thickness, so into 10 millimetre bands, so we were over things 30 to 39 millimetres, 40 to 49, and last year we were sitting there with a ruler. This gets rather tedious. So this year we improved things a little bit. On the left is the, or never, never got named anything differently, the brickometer. I tried working out the Latin for this, and it was a bit of a mouthful, so it stayed being the brickometer. And basically, I didn't take any prisoners, I, I labeled it in Roman numerals. So you can see that we went up to 60 to 69, and then anything thicker than that was going to count as a 70. Yeah. 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 So, so then, then we, actually, actually, if it fitted into the 10 or 20, that just went in the rubbish bucket because they didn't make bricks that thin. If it's a 10 or 20, it's just something that's broken and you can't be sure. The other bit got nicknamed the gibbet. A very quick knock-up, and it saved us breaking the tent. So rather than having to lift this, because when it's up at the tent, hanging off the tent roof, you stood up and you have to lift it to that high, but you start do that with 18 kilos every time. Yes, it's a good workout, but you rather wish you had. At least with the gibbet, this ended up being not much more than waist time, so it was a little easier. Slightly wobbly, but it didn't matter. Um, and so, yeah, we would do it that way. We started off in the open, but the weather at the start wasn't too bad. And um, if I go back a slide, you can see we're on a tarp. And you can see that's not the first day because the tarp's filthy. Everything ends up filthy very quickly. I was wearing needlers and you're kneeling in sort of wet, slurry mud that's coming off the stuff as you're cleaning it. And then you stand up and it just dribbles down the front. So you end up with a very distinctive sort of dirt pattern on your trousers. There we are. Um, so we st we're, we're on the tarp to start with. Second week, we got a second tent, so we were able, able to move everything that wasn't in the tent the first week down into the new tent and then take over second tent and double the tarp out. We could be running two teams at a time. So we knew there were going to be a lot of fines. We were, the dig was three weeks this time compared to a week and a bit last time. More people, more diggers, more fines. So we wanted to try and get into mass processing. So we had two lines of buckets and two teams and gave them nicknames. And we were on a ridge, slight ridge and furrow system. So at one point they were uphill and downhill for the people who were at the top of the ridge system and the bottom. A bit of fun. And you start sort of winding them up going, ha ha, you felt. So what we're after. So why are we doing all this? Well, the chap in the background there, 
is this guy, Peter Warry. Very clever guy. He used to be in industry, all sorts of really clever industry stuff. Now, this is where we get on to what's interesting about Tegla. So Tegla have got the ridges. So if you've got the upper layer and the lower layer, and you try and let me do it like that, and then nothing extra is done, and you overlap them, you've got a great big gap. That's not really great in buildings. So there's a clever system of cutaways that they've developed. So the lower tile on the top, yeah, top side have this notch cut out at loss of the bridge. And the bottom of the upper tile had cut outs here. And then they just mesh. But it turns out that over time, and we're covering a sort of four century period, this cutout system varied. Peter, for his thesis, had been around the country and he did this after retiring from normal work, if we can put it that way. Went around the country measuring over two and a half thousand tegulae in every way, creating a typology, and then he could. Combining that with stamps and cut stamps, and we'll come on to that. And you could then say, ah, well, that's a first century tile, or that's a second century tile. It established a whole seriation of Tegulai, which is really clever. So he did it using stamps. So not every tile is stamped, not every brick is stamped. Peter reckons about one in ten. As a stamp put in it, at Mindy at least. Legionary areas, <laughs> they tend to stamp everything because it was a bit you know, squaddy, you just a bosh, 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 the standard process, but elsewhere they didn't. Um, so he's very interested in the stamps. So you can hopefully make out there, we've got, and can I do the laser? Yes, I can do laser quite a good. We've got. TPF there. The yeah, F's a bit truncated, but we see enough of After a short while, you know there's only a certain number of combinations. You can see another TPF there. Um, look at that top one, I'm trying to remember what. Oh, yeah, this is a really poorly done HS, and this is part of a larger one that says LHS. So that's the S there. Doesn't show wonderfully well. Down here, you can see we've got another S. And the game was, as you're cleaning it, to try and spot these. In the trenches, they're supposed to spot them, but everything is covered in wet clay. So we, <laughs> there is no fault to attach to them, not finding. And on a good day, you'll find one or two sorting. On a, There was an absolutely mad half hour when we found... I think it was seven between four of us, and it was like, we found one, found one, found one, and it's going on. But, so we've got TPF. Let's go on to the next one. TPF, TPFP, TPFA, TPFC. Might have been a TPFB, but we're not quite sure. So, with Peter reckons TPF. I can't, I can't remember the Latin, Latin I'm afraid. afraid. Sounds for something like made in the public tile works. Um, and then we think that TPFP was Primus. So then it was just following a series. So this is the first one after that series. So first contractor, maybe. And then they went, hang on, the system isn't going to work very well. And then we just went ABC. Um, those stamps are really nice and clear. You can't miss those. Really obvious. Some are incredibly difficult to spot. And just occasionally I'd spot one that Peter would go, is it? Is it not? Now, he traces all of these on, to, on, you know, the old overhead projector clear film. So he'll sit there with a fine pen, trace them. He knows which dye they're made from. So they may be different dyes. Um... Probably metal letters set into something like wood, and then you get bits falling off, so you can, and the letter forms vary, 
And he'll go, oh, that's die number 21J. Super, super specialist. Um, but some of them, even just looking at them, you get to know, oh, that's that one with the really weird variation there. Um, so all of the TPFs and all of their variations all went to Siren Sester. Found virtually nowhere else. So public tile works made for Siren Sester. Similar system existed in Gloucester, apparently, Gluvencium. Um There, you've got the councillors' names on the tiles, which is distinctly unusual. Here we just get, it's a, it's a sort of corporation tile. Um, that's our mad half hour. You can see we've got, we've got an A there. That looks like a TPFP that's upside down. You can see there's part of an FP TPF there. It's difficult to show this without the examples, and unfortunately, I don't get to keep the examples. Um, now, what we then go on to is LHS. Hopefully, you can just about see Chloe, who is one of the... Um, Professional. So we, the dig was mainly, we had a core of about seven professionals on site all the time, and then at least double that number, if not three times that number of volunteers. Um, so every morning you get new people on site, so you, you fairly rapidly get to know how to give the tile talk, explaining things to people as they came in, which is how come I'm not really doing this with much in the way of notes. Um, but LHS, interestingly, they are found up and down Irving Street, as far as Little Put, and up in the other direction as well. So the thinking is, this is private industry using the corporate facilities, and that the LHS is probably one of these three-part Roman names. You know, they, they had the different, the trinomen, the cognomen, and the... Uh, what's the third bit? Oh, there's a question. Who knows the Latin naming systems? Anyway, but this is probably Lucius Hortius Smith or something. Um, and they are found of a wider area, so they were probably using it to create stuff. And we got interested in why, where these tiles were existing. So let's have a look at the trenches. So... This got the nickname of the Black Pit of Doom, brackets and glory. Black Pit of Doom because one, it was deep, wet summer, and you can see there it's been a rainy day. The first thing they had to do is bail it out. This is clay, of course. So bailing it out doesn't leave you with a wonderful surface. It leaves you with a bit of a squelchy mess. That hole was at least six foot deep. So you've got people going in, the, the trench was about a metre wide, so they've got just enough room to work. You can see it stepped down for safety. We did have a slight fall fall of some of the soil one day. The clay tends to stay where it's put. It's black because this is where they were chucking all their spoil tiles and their ash. Why is it a hole where they could put this? They probably emptied it of clay, taken, used it as a big clay pit to take clay out, and then put, wait, where are we going to stick this lot? Well, there's a hole over there, stick it in the hole. So there's probably a few of these around the place, but the stuff coming out of here, because it was the spoiler, yes, it's not up to sort of usable standards, but it was surprisingly good, and we'll see, you'll see some of the examples. But it came out, the clay had turned black because of the ash, it was very wet, very encrusted, and you had to brush it all down with nail brushes and toothbrushes just to see what you were doing. Made more fun by, depending on the colour of the tile, so that's a nice depending solid one, you could do tile, what you like to that. So that's that's nice indestructible. You could do what you like to that. That's indestructible. This orange, this if you orange, scrub it too hard, it just starts hard, dissolving. Just starts dissolving. So, so, all of... The um, stamps, Peter was going, just work around them, don't touch that side. 
because he wanted to leave the dirt in because it made the tracing easier and it, it stopped anyone destroying the evidence. So that's the black pit of doom and glory because of so many good things came out of it. But it the people coming out of there in boiler suits were filthy. They had a good time, but they were filthy. Um, this is the kiln. This is the main flue down middle. This is late on in, in the third week. So you can just about make out there. We've got some of these type tiles. Um, they're probably providing a drainage system because, of course, they dug down. And this is clay and it rains. Ends up full of water, so they have to sort of redirect the water out of the kiln. So you would put the burning wood in at this end, shove it in, and the structure will go to the top. We'll show what that looks like in a minute. You can see it's built out of brick and tile itself. Um, you do get a bit of a chicken and egg question of, well, hang on, where did that brick and tile come from? Um, also in trench front, and this represents a lot of work. This is, this was done last season, covered over with soil, and then uncovered in space about three days of frenetic digging to get down to the fabric that they covered it in. That was back breaking. Um, and then this is an, another two or three weeks worth of excavation on top of that to get all of this uncovered. Um, the landowner, who's an interesting character, quite fancies turning it all into some sort of museum. It is in a very obscure area down to narrow lanes. There's not much footfall there. You know, bless him for trying, but I <laughs> makes sense. You know, we're in the centre of the city compared to where he is. Um, so, trench one. So, we're now on my right hand. As that photo was taken, is where the the, the um, flu was. You can just about make out we've got post holes, so we can tell that we had a roof structure over the, over the kiln, which is nice. Um, and then if we go into the into it, these are the tiles that were providing the drainage ditch at the drainage gully system, and you can see they're stamped. It was it's very rare to find stamped embassies. These ones the um, but they are, um, which surprised us. And each of one of these ones forming this was so, so like, okay, interesting. You can see there, this is what I say about some of the letters falling off. This is a TPFP where the bottom half of the cur curved part of the P has just vanished, um, which makes it a fairly distinctive dye that we you know, Peter knew what that was pretty much without. And, and check. So, so what are we, we digging up? up? So that is what's called the hollow voussoir. And everyone, some of the names are, are really fun. Everyone pronounces voussoir in a particular way when they said it on the side of voussoir. Um, so this is a specialist version of it's not really a flu tile, although it looks a bit like a flu tile. So the, those lines in it are serving the same purpose. They're to hold the plaster work onto it. But this is a hollow tile, sort of, imagine a, a, a tube made of clay. It's about that tall, about that wide, and about that deep. And that's used for brick arches. So they're not entirely parallel sides, so you can then stack them up in your arch. And because they're hollow, they're nice and light. Um, so there was one particular guy we were saving everything up for who was going to come and measure and try and establish a seriation of all the flue tiles. So we were separating out all the flue tiles. The brick... And the tags and the embassies without the stamps just went to be disposed of, which is how come I've got 
But the voice files would definitely be kept. Um, and we found a fair few of those that got to recognise them in time. This thing is part of a thing called an armchair voussoir, which is a very thick, solid product, about that thickness. This is actually, it could be part of one of them. They had this distinctive cutout. This is part of one. And for the life of me, I cannot tell you how they went to form an arch. Apparently, it's not simple. But it's another thing from March. They probably had a Latin name, but we don't know it. Um, a Culeatus. At the start, it was coming out with these names, and it was like, so what? This is another one for arch building. So at one end, it's a big, imagine a rectangular tile about that wide, or about that size. But the thickness varies from about that at that end down to that at the other end. And then you can imagine, you put a whole load of them together, you get a nice fan-shaped arch. We didn't find too many of those, because it's not easy to spot, because they look a bit like a slightly deformed brick. You know, if you get just one end, you don't know whether you've got a cuneatus or just a plain brick. Um, they did hold a CBM day, the specialist who came from all over the country, came to admire all the special stuff we found. We had to arrange it all out by type, which was made more fun by Peter going down with COVID the day before. He was due to write it, so I, could, I got sent this document. Can you do all of this? It's like, uh, well, I've got to find this example and that example. Um, that's a somewhat deformed imbrex. It's come out of the back pit, so it's a spoiler. You could never use that on a roof because it's twisted. But it was about that long, which is about the right length. It's just deformed in the kiln. So chuck it in the, in the rubbish pit. Um, the imbrexes would have been held onto the roof just with a couple of dabs of mortar. Most of this was held in place by gravity. Um, but the if we come on to this, so that's a whole together. That is seven and a half kilos of tegular. So you imagine a roof covered in those with embassies at all the joints. Would have been incredibly heavy. Um insanely heavy. So they actually had to build in very strong roofs. What it doesn't show is these things were not entirely square. So to get the best registration like that, you actually want the bottom of the, of the upper tile to be narrower just by a fraction than the top of the lower tile. So their sides aren't exactly parallel with each other. But they've got a very distinctive pattern, as you can see later, that they make them. They make it, and they can tell this sort of thing by looking at sides. The underside's always rough on these ones, so we think that's the bottom. So they had a mould. They do the, as you've seen, the sort of modern handmade brick makers do, get your massive lump play, go, what? Draw across it with a piece of wood or something to get rid of the excess. They then put a neat groove down the side. Very distinctive. You get quite used to spotting, oh, well, this is a tegular that's lost a ridge piece, or this is just a piece of ridge, or helps if you've got a brain that works in a very visual way to try and spot what's what when you're sorting all of this. These stand out really well because they've just got a curve and nothing else has a curve. Um, the other thing that they have to do to some tegular, not all of them, is you've got this fan shape at the bottom. It's called a signature. Though there, there is debate as to what, what that is. It's usually two, three, two or three fingers just drawn in the clay. Maybe it's to say, you know, I'm working number two, I'm working number three, so that's my one. Um, we did find a few with four, and that 
I thought it was quite impressive because it requires a bit more sort of that stretch to get your arm in the right place to draw it around. So somewhat weird. But yeah, we did a lot of those ones with with that. What else do we get? That is a Lydian. So that trowel is about as long as my hand. Not yeah, a bit longer than my hand. These things weighed eight kilos. So one guy bought three of these in a barrel and it's plenty of room to be dealing with on the skiddy stuff. And they all came out of solid. Why they were in the spoilers, we don't quite know. So these were absolutely flat, about that thick, good solid things. These would be used as a strengthening layer in the walls. So you see the sort of red bands in the walls. Um, I'm trying to fit it into a bucket to weigh. Is interesting. interesting. Now, this, this is glorious. glorious. This, this came, came out of the back of the Doom, Rocket and Glory. And it's a box flutile, virtually complete. There's a bit around the far side that's missing. Um, held together with masking tape because it wasn't whole in, in, the, in the trench, unfortunately. It's got all of these combed marks on it. Now, it's, most of the hot air just goes up, enters at the bottom, which is open as well, and goes up. But you've also got these holes on the side in case you want to start getting fancy in your heating system and branching out sideways. So you could end up with a really complex system built into your wall. Um... So, so, yes, that, that, that was interesting for leaning that because we knew that that was going to be museum quality. Because all it takes is a little bit of glue and then you stand it in a cabinet and nobody will know that it's not right. Um, absolutely beautiful. Everyone's very pleased with that. What do you think's on the top of that one? It's a Roman footprint. Those are his hobnails. So, we only came up with two of those. You don't get many of them. So, the system that they had would have involved, you know, you make, it, make all of the stuff in, you know, by generally throwing mud at throwing your wet clay at the mould, make it off. Then it has to dry. So, lay it flat for a while. Until it was dry enough and stable enough that it could be stacked on end under shelters, just like they do with modern handmade bricks, and then eventually fired. And it looks like someone just forgot where he's putting his foot. And so, not many of those at all, only two of those in the whole year. Oh, I see. But what we do get plenty of. It's dog footprints. And Peter, bless him, being the purist, and he's looking for information he can tell, tell from the tile goes, damaged tile. Because it doesn't tell you anything. We all know that the Romans had dogs. It tells you rough size, maybe, but then you don't know whether it's a puppy or a full-size dog, so it's sort of like... But they, they would use them. Um... But we, we were getting maybe a couple a day with, with animal prints on, which is so nice. I've got a couple at home. Um, we have not the slightest clue what that is. It's sort of incised lines. You can see we've left the dirt from the black bit of doom. And glory in, in there, the, just so it's, it's easier, easier to read the tiles, as it were. But what is it, Roman rocket ship? It, it just makes, makes no sense. sense. We, we, we have, have absolutely no idea, idea what that is. Roman military, <laughs> well, well, yeah, it's, it's almost, almost like, like the board hour isn't it? Yeah. The, the war department. Um, yeah, yeah we're gonna very, very odd now. 
This is particularly nice. So you can see this. Everyone see it. Can everyone see it? So we've got a C there that is really obvious, and two short verticals there. Peter assured me that apparently two short verticals is an E in cursive Latin. I'm taking his word for it. Yeah. So what is this? So first thought was, okay, as in, behold. Not very plausible. Quite fun, but not very plausible. Um, fake it. The E C in fake it is more plausible. It's not at all unknown. In Roman tiles, for people, people to you know, bring you over fake it. I made this. Um, last year we had one that had M incised into it, which was probably just a count. It was a thousand, thousandth cut tile. Um, but they get quite special, you know, finding ones like that. That that was the only lettering. That was in size that we found this year. And going by the black, that came out of the black pit as well. The rest of the site didn't go black like that, it was mainly orange clay. Um, the, about the last day I was there, we got this. So you can see we've got a vertical scratch there, one scratch there, and another scratch there. So some, some sort of very large Latin asterisk, maybe very odd. Um, can't think of any good reason for that. It seems to be on a piece of brick, so um, so this is a drone photograph. These days, drones have changed archaeology. No more balancing on the top end of a ladder with holding a camera out there trying to get a clear photo. You just throw a drone up and it just takes a beautiful shot from the air. But you can see there's the central flue, there's the supporting walls. We've got the drain coming out this way, um, the edge of the wall there. So that's trench one. We did have more trenches. So this is from an even higher shot, slight angle. We've got trench one there, black pit of doom and glory there. Um, another pit, there, another trench there, which turned out to be exceedingly boring. And not much came out of that one. It's a very shallow um, pit feature filled with just throw away bits of pot. Um, well, that's not pot of ceramic building material. We did get pottery. We got more pottery this year by a long way than last year, but it's still not an awful lot. It's probably just whatever they used for their lunch. There's no signs of actual occupation here. Um, there's a, a ditch feature there that had also been filled in with um, broken tile on the brick. So, so it, it, it seems, seems like every time they made a hole, they ended up with they ended up with spoilers, which they uh, where's the hole? Shop, keep on shoving it in holes, and they were probably forming paths out of it as well. Because when this stuff gets wet, you you know even with your with with Roman hobnails, you're going to skid around. It just. Makes you appreciate chalk. Mm. You know, a bit of rain, give it half a day, and you can wander around in it perfectly safely. Um, so, quantities 3,500 kilograms of brick. So, not this has all been counted, and some of the fragments are down to this sort of size. So, I reckon that. Probably represents at least 10,000 different items that we've sat there going one, two, three, four. Um, where did it all go? Well, 
I was taking some of it away, um, of which this is a sample. Um, the landowner, bless him, so we, he said, get all here, I'll take it away. Well, he'd got some various containers. We'd fill it up in half a morning, and he was getting behind on the pile to get more. Last year, he took it away, and he built a pizza oven after it, which apparently he could fire up, get hot, and then it would cook a pizza in one minute. Which may just indicate he's using too much fuel. Um, I wasn't there, but on, apparently on the last dig day, he had had a pizza firing session, and everyone was having pizza. So it's three and a half thousand kilograms is a lot. Eighteen kilos max to a bucket that represents heaven alone as how many bucket loads. And yeah, uh, so that was that was a lot of counting. I was in charge of 3,000 kilograms of that. They managed 500 on the last three days that I missed. Um, so this is roughly speaking what it would have looked like. But this is not to scale. This is far smaller. So you've got the flu in. Your end wall is built out of bricks. On our kiln, the rest of the structure would have then been something like a wattle structure with clay pressed over it. Because we found plenty of pieces of fired, very fired blue clay with various holes running through it where the bottles were, you know, where the wood were, were, was. Um, when they finished, so they built this around the stuff they wanted to fire, the end walls would probably stay there longer term. But then you'd build your curved structure over it, you'd have a, a watch hole in it, or more than one. They had to judge the temperature just by eye. So as the temperature goes up, the colour varies, the, the colour glow that you see. So an experienced pottery master would be able to say, ah, oh, that's now getting to that sweet spot of sort of whatever the colour would be. And you'd know that it was time to stop firing and let it cool down. They then hack their way in through the walls. And so it's a very destructive process that you're sort of building your kiln and then half destroying it over and over and over. Um, so it was seasonal. Um, you couldn't be doing this the rest of the year. Yeah, so, um, so firing the kiln, May to September, it took them. The size can we got? I think it took about a thousand items, Peter reckoned. So it would take about two weeks. So that's heating it up, holding it at a temperature for a while, then letting it cool down. And there's a lot of thermal mass in a thousand items. If a thousand items and your items are weighing maybe five to eight kilos, maybe the bipedalis is apparently almost too heavy to lift. Person, so that's sort of 20 plus kilos. That's a lot of thermal energy you're storing. Um, so they fire in the summer. In the autumn, they would dig the clay out of the holes um, and then pile it somewhere so that over winter it um, was left to weather. That helps break it down so you haven't got quite as much of a hard job getting into a the state where you can actually throw it at your mould and spread it out. And it would run around like that. Um, and you probably also use win winter to cut down the trees when the sap was at a minimum, so that you could then fire your kiln. And we were probably needing to deforestation because you're going to need a lot of timber to, to fire this. So the, one of the questions that came up was, you know, how long did this run? Well, we think it, from the stamps and the style, is, we think it may only have been 50 to 70 years, but probably by the end of that, you made a heck of a dent in the local forest. Um, and, oh, I should also mention, 
So, so on the last, uh, virtually the last day, they sort of solved this chicken and egg situation. You can see that down the side there, we've got an edge. Turns out that roughly where I'm marking with the sort of pseudo laser, it was vitrified. So the clay had turned to virtually a sort of glassy light. It turns into this sort of, it almost looks like emerald. Um, sort of very glossy green. So if that's fired there, but that's on the outside of a kiln, that means it's not the outside of a kiln. That there is the flue of an earlier kiln that's then been built into the structure of the next one. So probably some of this structure was fired in this kiln. So, so we've now got a target for next year. <coughs> and cultural archaeology are actually a charity, bless them. So they do um, what all the pre pre build archaeology, like you do for a developer archaeology, so that if you can move to the shopping centre, they'll come in and do the archaeology to record it all. They use some of the profits for the, from that to do this community archaeology. So it's not cheap running this. You've got seven or eight staff for three weeks. You've got to buy a whole load of extra equipment because we were getting through it. Um, so they said, yes, one last hurrah was Neil Holbrook's words about it next year. So I think we've got one more season of digging. You still get a chicken and egg. That, where did the brick for that kill the first kiln come from is probably smaller scale ones and then they've wrapped up the scale as they went and could, you know once you can you've got a kiln that's big enough to fire once to build the structure of the bigger one then you set for a while and you can just keep on reusing it and rebuilding it um the soil there is, so the site has been i mentioned Ridge and furrow Medieval times, not much going on apart from lots of farming and left the plough. The medieval plough came, there was a low point ran through the site about there. So the next one's going to be about here. And it destroyed it and spread it everywhere. So all of the topsoil is absolutely thick with bits of tile and brick. So you have to look at everything. But the really interesting stuff in terms, in terms of trying to understand the the development of the site comes from the structure itself. So, where did it all end up? So, that's not where some of it's ended up. That's a raised border in my garden. Those of you who walked past our house, like, you know, we had builders in over the winter. They trashed the garden. We thought, Right, right, we're going to switch to raised borders, have a low, low maintenance garden. That whole front wall is built out of Roman material that I was allowed to take away. I was using big plastic sacks, coming away with one or two per day. And I've came away with a bit too much. These aren't terribly easy to use up in your wall, other than serving the original purpose of sealing the top. I've, personally, I really like that you've got this bit of tile that failed in its, in its first job. And here it is. Where are we? So this site dated to around tail of the first into the mid-second century. So about, what, 1850 years plus, the tile and brick finally gets to do what it was made for. We've, I've used some of the, the flat pieces in paving. So we've got a crazy paving type bit where we've used some of the flat pieces. So, um, yeah, it lives on. Um, and I've got a couple of nice pieces right at the foreground down here that have the animal prints in, just so that you can send the grandchildren off. And can you find the animal prints? Um, and it's perfectly good to build with. This stuff, the bluey, bluey stuff, which shows it's been fired more. The more it's been fired, the more blue it turns. 
it's, it's indestructible. It's lovely stuff. That's, That's a bit iffy building it in, but I did it anyway. So, are there any questions? Yes, Jan. What prompted the dig in the first place? Was it the pieces coming to the surface? Yeah, what prompted... So, for those on Zoom, what prompted the dig in the first place? The Lando... Well, my team was known as a... Uh, as a kiln area anyway. There's not far away, there was a medieval kiln. But the landowner kept on coming up with, when he was working on his land, Roman... What he thought was Roman... And the folks got to all archaeology because that's the nearest one. They're not far. Their headquarters is just down the road at Kemble. And he approached them and said, I think it's this. And then it took a while to, for the cogs to turn and the system to work. But then they said, yeah, OK, maybe it is. Maybe we should do a dig. They did geophys, first of all. I haven't got the geophys images. But that main kiln stands out like a beacon on the magnetometry. You know, um, it... Because when you fire the clay, it breaks in the magnetic field of, and it stands out like a cunt. It, it makes it, it was a large beacon saying, dig here. Yeah. And it, it, it is the, the best hole they've got. Um, the other holes that are very thick in the stuff also show up as, as distinct blobs. So, yeah. Yes. Bricks and tiles to send to Sirencester and Bath and pages like that. Yeah, they, they were making bricks and tiles primarily to go to Sirencester. So, so well, it, looks it looks like, like most, most of the time, time the production was all this TPF stamped stuff. Not every piece was TPF stamped, but it was all going to Sirencester apart from this patch of private industry using the public tile works. But then they sold up and down Irving Street. It didn't go down to Bath, it just went up down Irving Street because that palace is nearby. And that's probably, there's probably not an awful lot of clay around, certainly in around Sarantis. No, I think, I, th I think you're right. I think this area is, is really good for clay because it's part of an old river system, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Cassie, yeah. in Sarantis, to have the found any examples of an arch being built with these tiles? Ooh. I mean, you're thinking about them because it won't be standing today. Yeah, I think you, they probably, I don't know, but I think they probably have found the pieces of them, but I don't think there's enough, there's massive standing archaeology like you'd have at Pompeii. Um, well, I was thinking of Chetford. Yeah. Know? Um, There's nothing about of, of course, if it's in a structure and you haven't got the structure lying on the ground, you can't find the stamps to really know where the where it came from. So at Chidworth, any any arches you've got, you don't want to destroy. So you then having to hunt around. And I think Chidworth was excavated so long ago that nobody kept the tile and brick. Yeah, because you know for a long time in archaeological digs they go. Oh, well, it's a stamp. That's interesting. But something like that, they go, well, that doesn't tell us anything. Then chuck it in a rubbish part. It's only Peter who comes along and goes, oh, well, there's a system of these to these that we can then learn something from. It goes to tell you that you shouldn't really put too much on the rubbish pile. But when I take that attitude with the Band of Brothers finds, Dan Miles goes, ah, Throw it away. But I don't want to throw it away because I think maybe someone will come along and say, ah, there's more information we can get from this. Um, um, there's a small forest near Mighty called Brayton Forest, and the locals think that it's an ancient forest which may well have been planted um, for the purpose of providing timber um, and, and, and not used properly. Yes, yeah, so so, so Terry's mentioned a forest that's near Mighty. Yeah, you, you probably, probably after a while, did have to try and manage your whole woodlands area to generate enough fuel. I would imagine that they probably came across coppicing and, and pollarding as a, as a technique, because you certainly wouldn't want to be trying to grow it from an acorn again. 
Um, that area in winter, you know, around that site, apparently ends up virtually underwater. It, there's just no drainage. It's very flat up there. And you said that Lloyd joining Cox. Oh, yeah. So, Lloyd, um, Mark Hart's stepson, um, he came along last year, did a few few days, he was along this year doing a few days, and he's now got a job with Cotswold Archaeology. So, um, they're, they're a good lot of Cotswold Archaeology um, because they're not out and out commercial, they do commercial work. They, they do community outreach as well. They do a few bits. So they've been involved in Suffolk in a B-17 um, project to try and find all the evidence of crash B-17. So they don't do just Roman. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's a lot of work for Cotswold in Suffolk because they're doing the size as well. Uh, seas, yeah, yeah, that that big site. So, and you know the the archaeologists have had a whale of a time with your with the um, HS two because it's one one long archaeological site, and you you're doing so much that yeah, it was generating a huge amount of work, which of course means you're generating a huge amount of cost, which is why they're probably going. <laughs> Not just the archaeologists, but by any means, but yeah. Any more? For any more? One thing. Yeah. Do you think the, the archaeologists of the future are going to think when they come across your raised bed? <laughs> <laughs> it will confuse them. To, you know, know, the, the, to, to be, be honest, honest, I'm not alone in doing this. Not, you know, the learned owner has been building his stuff out of it. A number of archaeologists I know, you, you know, with appropriate permission, take bits away from their site. But another one of my raised borders has a brick from the farm lane camp built into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, if if my walls last long enough for an archaeologist to find them, I've done well. <laughs> that wall does look fairly straight. That was my third raised border. Some of the others look distinctly rustic, which was part of our intention. So, but I did, I did get better. How are you going to fill back then? That yes, that has now been filled, um, and the space to the left of it has been paved. If you come past our house, have a peek in. We've now got a bit of a plaza between the raised borders. Um, and what's in the raised borders will be covered in a future talk because I found a lot because I was sieving the soil, which has to be almost more boring than counting 3,000 kilograms of brick and tile because I wanted to get rid of all the weed roots. But when you sieve it and you do archaeology, you can't help but find stuff. But I'm not going to tell you what happened. Because that's the next talk. And I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Grant, yes. thanks very much, Cassie, for a um, really interesting talk. Uh, it, it, it's amazing what's behind the scenes with these things. You know, you, you see the end product like that, but the tons of pay and everything that comes out to get to these few bits, although. You had more bits than you expected. Um, That's a very big part. Uh, so thanks for that, Cassie. And uh, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you.